So this morning we are continuing our series on Advent, and we're looking um, at the topic of joy. And as we do that, this morning's message is kind of unique and kind of weird in that I'm going to try to address two different topics using the exact same text. If you've got your Bibles this morning, would you turn with me to the Old Testament prophet by the name of Habakkuk? Habakkuk is where we're going to be this morning. If you don't know where that is, turn to the book of Matthew, turn left about 15 pages or so, um, and you will find the words of this prophet, Habakkuk. And I want to read three different sections from this book, this letter this morning, and reflect on two things that is dominant in this book. The first is connected, well, this um, one is connected with the Advent seri- season as we look at the theme of joy. And as I read and speak this morning, I'll pray that the Holy Spirit would give you clarity. Ask, I pray that the Holy Spirit will give me clarity and that he would open our hearts to receive his word. So the first passage I want to look at is Habakkuk chapter 1, and I want to look at the first several verses, if you would read with me. Verse 1, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise, and so the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. If you would flip over to chapter 2, and I'm going to read the first four verses there. It says, I will take a stand at my watchtower and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer complaining concerning my complaint. The righteous shall live by faith. And I actually had all of these points down. I had my notes down. Everything was ready to go. And I was going to talk to you about our how we have lost our ability to laugh and lost our ability to enjoy life. I've had illustrations to drive those points home. And then over the last two weeks, the grand juries in both Staten Island, New York, and in Ferguson both came back with saying that police officers that were involved in the deaths of African-American individuals, unarmed African-American individuals, were not going to be indicted for their deaths. Two different juries reached the exact similar conclusions that these police officers will not be indicted. One of those instances was completely caught on video from the beginning till the end. And hearing the verdict where all the evidence was there for us to see, the words of the prophet Habakkuk rung out louder than ever before. How long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you that there's violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you look idly at wrong? Destruction, violence are before me. Strife, contention arise. The law is paralyzed. Justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice is perverted. See, the lament of Habakkuk 2,600 years ago verberates throughout the centuries, ringing as clearly today as it did when he first spoke those words. It's a cry uttered by many in the last two weeks in the wake of the grand jury's decision not to indict these police officers. One, in the case of Eric Garner, and secondly, in the case of Michael Brown. Before, Eric Garner, before, Ma- before Michael Brown, Eric Garner was killed. Before Eric Garner, it was Jordan Davis. Before Jordan Davis, it was Renisha McBride. Before her, it was Rekia Boyd. Before Rekia Boyd, it was Trayvon Martin. Before them, it was Tarika Wilson and her infant. Before them, it was Emmett Till. And it's a long list of injustice that doesn't span just a few months, but centuries along the way. Since Michael Brown, it was 12-year-old Tamir Rice, killed by police as they pulled up to a Cleveland area community center. His toy pellet gun was mistaken for a real gun, and they shot him to death outside of this community center. Even this morning, if you've opened up CNN, there was a story of a man in Phoenix, Arizona, where police mistaken a bottle of pills for a gun, and he was gunned down. From Ferguson to Staten Island to Cleveland to Phoenix, even to I-35, 
here in Dallas, these last two weeks, many have cried the lament of Habakkuk, Oh Lord, how long? How long shall we cry? How long shall injustice prevail? And meanwhile, in many non-African American communities, they wonder how long do we have to endure such protests? How long do we have to watch people shut down interstates? How long do we have to see riots and looting every time people disagree with a verdict determined by the justice system? How long do we have to listen to this, some wonder? Maybe even this morning you're wondering why a preacher who's not white or black is speaking on this topic and talk, addressing it. See, according to the Pew Research Center, the majority in our nation cannot accept, they don't understand why people can't accept that the evidence presented to them did not justify an indictment. They don't understand why people can't accept the evidence presented um, was clear as day. The majority of white Americans trust that the police will do their jobs. They acknowledge the incredible challenges that police officers face in our cult community, and that's true. So they ask questions, how long will people bring this up? How long will we continue to play the race card? Even on a news channel this week, I heard one guy commenting that we owe Michael, um, I'm sorry, Darren Wilson an apology for the things that he had to go through because of this case. But here lies the problem. Here lies the great divide between cultures. See, according to that same Pew survey, the other went on to finish seminary, finished his MDiv, then finished his PhD, and then worked in a seminary for a while, and now is a president of a university right outside Oklahoma City. I remember when we were in seminary days, we would sit and we would talk in, in our, I can't remember if it was in a one-on-one -on -one conversation or in our Christian ethics class, the topic of race came up, and one of them made this statement that the two of them beat the odds. They beat the odds that were against them. He said, stats show that he is three times more likely to live in poverty than someone like me. He is 10 times more likely to be incarcerated. He is 21 times more likely to be killed by the police. See, their families probably taught them how to beat the odds, not just about working hard and not just about doing well in school, but they taught them how to be a young African-American living in this country. There was a story in the Washington Post by a man by the name of Lawrence Otis Graham. He's an African-American Ivy League educated attorney in New York City. And he wrote an article in the Washington Post about the rules that he teaches his teenage sons. The first rule that he teaches them, never run in the view of a police officer or a security person unless it is clearly apparent that you are jogging for exercise because a cynical observer might think you are fleeing a crime or about to commit a murder. Other rules include carry a small, t small tape recorder with you everywhere you go in case you get pulled over, begin recording. Never leave a shop without a receipt, no matter how small a purchase, so that you cannot be accused unfairly of theft. Do not go for pleasure walks in a residential neighborhood after sundown. If you wear a t-shirt to an outdoor event, it should bear the name of a respected and recognized school emblazoned on its front. Listen, I was never taught that growing up. I don't have to teach that to my kids. Leonard Pitts of Miami Herald put it this way in an opinion piece he wrote last week. He said, too many, not all, but too many people still live in air castles of denial, still thinking abiding injustice and ongoing oppression are some sort of fairy tale lie or scheme of African Americans concocted to defraud us. Or else these things are far away and have no impact on our lives. His words convicted me. The words of Habakkuk, how long, O Lord? See, that was the question that Habakkuk asked. It's the question on the mouth of many individuals today. And you've got to ask, how does God respond? He responds with a challenge. In chapter 2, he says, write the vision. Make it plain on the tablets so that the runner may read it. That's what we're told in chapter 2. The English translation is kind of weak. The Hebrew is translated, write the vision down. Make it plain 
so that the run the, so that the one who reads it will run the vision offered by the hebrew prophets was a vision of a city it was a vision of zion it was the vision of the city of god the vision that the prophet isaiah spoke about where swords were beaten into farming tools and spears were turned into pruning hooks where nations will not lift sword against other nations and where, where we will study war no more a vision where wolves will live alongside sheep and calf and lion will graze on the same field where they will not hurt or they will not destroy or gun down or mistake a toy gun for a real gun this vision informs Jesus vision for the world the kingdom of God that Jesus brings the beloved community that draws into him the church a kingdom of justice and mercy and love a community where the hungry are fed the sick are healed the homeless housed demons exercised the sinful forgiven the sad comforted the lonely welcomed the outcast included the hopeless inspired the dead raised to new life a community no longer defined by greek or gentile or jew or greek or free or slave or male or female or black or white or green or yellow or any other human concoction of race that divides us but a community united and adopted by Jennifer Hart and her spouse reflecting on that adoption experience Jennifer Hart said people always tell us how lucky this boy is when we adopted him I tell you we are most lucky because we've adopted him he inspires us every single day he has proven doctors psychologists and teachers wrong his future is not bleak he is a shining star in the world his light shines on bright on everyone who crosses his path the tuesday after the michael brown ver um, case was the indictment was not given devonte and his parents went to a ferguson rally in portland oregon there was a police barricade that was set up for crowd control and this little boy was facing the police in riot gear he was afraid he stood trembling and weeping in front of the barricade holding a sign that read free hugs after a while one of those helmeted soldiers sergeant brett barnum approached him with an extended hand he posed some basic starter questions so what's your favorite subject in school what do you like to do in the summer what do you like to do for fun and then he asked why are you crying and Devante shared his fears about police brutality toward young black kids. And Sergeant Barnum responded, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then he pointed to Devante's sign and he said, do I get one of those? And they embraced. Unknowing to him, their embrace was captured by a freelance photographer. That's Devante behind us. In a world where we often wonder how long write the vision embody the vision make it plain so that all who witness it will be inspired to run to work for a different world in a world that is defined by division and violence and injustice a world where fig trees seldom blossom and fruit is hard to find and people are often cut off from one another may we as a church join habakkuk rejoicing in the lord exalting in the god of our salvation who makes our feet like deer to run with perseverance the race that is set before us keeping our eyes fixed on the vision God's vision perfected in Jesus our coming king wait for it it will not tarry such a vision is worth the wait such a God is worth our worship I want to introduce you to this man by the name of Habakkuk see when we meet him in our text he isn't a very happy man in fact he's an angry man one that's lost his ability to smile and have joy you couldn't blame him he really didn't have a reason to smile anymore he lived in the city of Jerusalem around 640 BC 150 years have passed since prophet Hosea has passed away 
The nation of Assyria has overtaken northern Israel, and about 70% of the population has been slaughtered. The few survivors that were remaining were captured into captivity and never heard from. Again, ten tribes of Israel ceased to exist in one of the first genocides of human history. Now, there were only two tribes left, Judah and Benjamin. And a new superpower has arisen, a new enemy that the people of Israel had to deal with. They had an army that was slowly conquering the entire known world, and they were now facing the people people of Israel. Habakkuk had every right to fear. He had every right to be angry. He feared that the Babylonian army would do to Judah what the Assyrian army had did to northern Israel. He lost all joy, and his life is full of fear. He is in need of serious joy, and before the story is over, we discover that through a series of conversations with God, his fears are overtaken with joy and faith in the God that he serves. See, here's the primary lesson that we learn from the story of Habakkuk. Joy sings, and fear will flee. See, when we first meet Habakkuk, he's angry until you find out what God's work is. God says, I'm actually going to take this Babylonian army, the one that hates me and hates you, and I'm going to let them overtake you. I'm going to let them conquer you. And here's how God describes the Babylonian army in chapter 1. These are God's words. He says, they're a dreaded and fearsome people. They're a bitter and hasty people. They're swifter than leopards. They're wolves of dust. They're vultures sweeping, uh, sweeping in to devour. There are people bent on violence. This is God describing the people that he's going to use. And Habakkuk is horrified at the thought of this. He's not horrified at the Babylonians. He's horrified that God would use wicked people as a sort of judgment. It would be like us complaining about the wickedness of America and pleading with God to judge our land for all of its injustice and all of its godless materialism and all of its abortions. And then God says, okay, I hear you. And I'm going to send some Islamic terrorists. I'm going to send ISIS to plant nukes in your city, to cause terror to reign in the streets, for the economy to collapse, and society as we know for it to unravel. And like Habakkuk, we would scream, God, I didn't mean it that extreme, right? I mean, show judgment, but not that crazy. So the prophet says in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I'm going to take my stand on the watch court, watch post, and station myself on the tower, and I'm going to look out and see who will say to me, and I will answer concerning my complaint. He's like an angry little child here. I don't know if you guys have seen little kids, like my little kids, when we go to the store, they want everything and anything, right? And when we say no, they just start throwing a hissy fit. I remember one time one of my kids would just lie on the floor and just cry and scream. I'm like, that's what Habakkuk is like here. He's like, I'm not leaving here until I get my way. I'm not moving until you do what I want you to do. I'm going to stay up here and I'm going to hold my breath, God. I'm just going to do what I'm just going to show you how angry I can get until you do what I want you to do. See, every one of us has been angry or confused more than once at the way that God handles our business. We forget that He is God and we are not. So God gives the prophet one of the most famous statements in the Bible, something that's repeated numerous times in the New Testament. He says, the righteous shall live by faith. It's ironic that the name Habakkuk means to embrace. God is telling the prophet that he has to embrace God's plan for his life. See, the very essence of faith is to embrace God's way even when it is beyond our capacity to understand or even when it is beyond our capacity to agree with it. See, faith is the issue for Habakkuk. And can I suggest that faith is the issue for us? There's an old saying that says that we plan, God laughs. See, until we embrace God's plan for our lives, even when it makes no sense, we're not going to find joy. Hebrews 12.2 says to the weary of heart, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. You can even translate that verse to say, who for the joy set before him embraced the cross. Jesus 
didn't initially embrace it. We know the story of him praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was pleading with God, Father, take this cup from me. Father, remove this from me. He was asking God, find another way. Do it another way. He doesn't want to go to the cross. Initially, he was fighting it as much as possible, but then he makes this statement. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. But once he exercised his faith, he found joy. And then you see Habakkuk finally able to embrace God's plan for Israel, and it wasn't easy for him. He says in verse chapter 3, verse 16, he says, I hear this, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. And I suggest that Jesus must have felt that way when he picked up that cross. I bet some of you know what it's like to have a pounding heart and trembling legs. But then all of a sudden, in verse 18 of Habakkuk 3, you see this statement of a complete turnaround in his life. He says, I see all this. I hear this and let you know that you've been laid off. It could have been when the doctor walks in and gives you a report that you didn't want to hear. It could be the moment when the person that you hoped to marry said, oh, I just want to be friends. It's that moment when your plans and your dreams and your hopes and your future begin to crumble underneath your feet and you have no idea what to do. And now you have to come to grip with God's management of your life. And, you, and how will you respond when your heart pounds and decay creeps into your bones? Habakkuk says in verse 16, Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity. The Hebrew word patience is very similar to the Greek word for patience. It literally means to stay under the load. To put it another way, it says, I'm not going to cut and run off. I'm not going to fall apart. And Habakkuk doesn't try to put a smiley face on the future. If you read verse 17, it doesn't look promising. He speaks of a land that's basically going to be reduced to waste. One might even say that Habakkuk, like Christ after him, embraced the pain. See, as long as we see pain as the enemy and fight it or fixate on it or exhaust ourselves angling for a softer landing, we will never be able to relax and enjoy each day at a time. See, there is a relief that happens when we throw our hands up in the air and say, God, I cannot fix this. This belongs to you. There's a huge sense of relief when that happens in your life. And in the end, it is all about perspective. See, we can change some things in our lives, but most things are beyond our control. To make a bumper sticker PG and appropriate for church, stuff happens. We can either focus on the bad news or we can rejoice in the good news of the gospel. And Habakkuk makes a choice in verse 18. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. He will focus on the goodness of his God rather than in the badness of the world. See, we all have a choice. Bad times can either make us better or they can make us bitter. King Saul refused to go out and fight Goliath. He stayed in his tent. He was seized by terror every time he heard the voice of the, Goliath, voice of the giant bellowing out his challenges. So he said, I'm staying in here. That boy... Is too, he's too big to hit. David took a stone and a slingshot and, a, and his um, rod and he walked out and he proclaimed, that boy's too big for me to miss. Listen, it's all about perspective. Where's your focus? See, are you glum? Go out and find a reason to rejoice. Are you discouraged? Look back on your life and think about all of the times that God has been good to you. Remind yourself, he's been faithful, he's been good, he's provided, he's helped, he's healed, he's delivered, he's taken care of me. And in the midst of your pain and agony, find a way to say, yet I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Choose to praise God. Say with the prophet, yet I will rejoice. I will be joyful in the God of my my Savior. Joy is a perspective. Secondly, joy is a person. Look carefully at the second phrase in verse 18 of Habakkuk chapter 3. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Notice the word God 
appears before the word Savior. God is who he is. Savior is what he does. See, when we get into tough spots, we desperately need God to come and get us out of our mess. In other words, we need him to save us. But the truth is, we don't need him to save us as much as we just need him. Too often when we praise him, it's about what he has done for us. And conversely, when we complain, it's about what he hasn't done for us. Frankly, our focus is less than best when we rejoice in the salvation of our God rather than in the God of our salvation. See, earlier Habakkuk, when there is a negative report, See, when Job lost everything that God had given him, he was still able to rejoice in the God of his salvation. See, we often say that Jesus is the reason for the season, but often the season becomes about what we get rather than about the giver of all the gifts that we have received. Listen, I am so glad that Jesus came and died for my sins to rescue me from hell. I'm so glad that I don't have to go to hell. I am so glad that he has blessed me and provided for me and taken care of me. I am so glad that he is working on my behalf. But can I tell you that I am more delighted that he has come so that he wants to say that I belong to him, that he wants a relationship with me, that he wants to be involved in my life, that he wants me. See, if you will rejoice in the, your God and not fixate on the things he gives, you will discover that joy is a person. It's a person. Number three, joy is a promise. Verse 18 again. I want you to focus on that next phrase. I will rejoice in God, my Savior. He's grasping the terrifying thought that sin has consequences. God judges because he is a holy God. But he's also a merciful God. Sometimes he allows us to go through seasons of discipline because he wants to shake us up, grow us up, and build us up. That's part of him saving us. Corey Ten Boom's sister looked at the smoke that was, bellow, that was coming out of the ovens of a concentration camp in Germany, and she made the statement, she said, no pit is so deep that God is not deeper still. See, the message of Christmas is that God is willing to descend into the deepest pits of hell so that we can ascend to the highest heights of heaven. Habakkuk knows that the Babylonian conquest of Israel is only part of God's plan for his salvation. See, 70 years after that horrible holocaust, a handful of Jewish survivors will return to the promised land. Israel will be reborn. A savior will come. He's a Jew. And look again at verse 18. He says, the God, my savior. God in the flesh will live the sinless life that we cannot live, take on the sins that we cannot bear ourselves, die a death beyond our capacity to die, endure a hell that we have endured, for, earned for ourselves, and then rise from the dead to conquer every power that is beyond our ability to overcome. See, the Babylonian invasion was essential to the flow of history that brings about the crucifixion. And as a result, people from every tribe and every nation and every tongue can now come into the family of God and become one. Let me repeat, this is the heart of the Christmas message. It is not only true in the global sense, it is true in each of our individual lives. All of us have committed more sins than we care to admit. We've stained our lives and everyone who touches us. But Jesus comes and he covers our stains, not with a band-aid, but with the spotless body of his life. He covers our sin with his righteousness, our shame with his glory, our insecurities with his love, and our fears with his promise. Joy is not just a perspective, it's not just a person, it is also a promise to us. Number four, joy is a present. Joy is a present. Don't check out on me yet, I'm almost done. This is the most important thing I'm going to say. You can plug into a movie that will make you laugh and you can spend all night at a comedy club and you can hang out with all your friends and laugh all you want laughter is a good medicine but the wisest man to ever live on the face of the earth said even in laughter my heart is sorrowful see joy is different 
than laughter. It's deeper. It's more satisfying. You can make yourself laugh, but you cannot manufacture joy. You can't go to a joy store and buy 10 ounces of joy. Galatians says the fruit of the Spirit is joy. True joy, lasting joy, eternal joy is only a gift from God himself. Habakkuk finally understands this. He ends by saying in verse 19, God, voice and the God of our salvation. He's telling the band, tune your instruments. He's telling the musicians, get your voices ready. He's telling the choir, get ready to sing. Let us rejoice in the God that we serve. Joy is contagious. The psalmist writes in Psalms 30, he says, weeping will endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The shepherds were outcasts in the dark, but after they worship the newborn king, joy comes in the morning of their lives. Magi lay their gift at the Savior's feet, but they go away rejoicing that the Savior has arrived. Joy comes from worship. The angel calls us to come with the shepherds. And can you imagine we all crowd around the manger to gaze in wonder? Emmanuel, God is with us. God has shown up on the scene. And can you imagine as we are staring, all of a sudden we hear laughter. We pause, we turn around, we look around, and there he is. This old Israeli prophet, still dressed in clothes from centuries before. We recognize him. It's that prophet Habakkuk. He's shoving his way forward to look at the baby. This is God, my Savior. This is who I was rejoicing in when I didn't know what was going to happen in my life. This is who I was believing in when everything looked glim. This is who I was rejoicing in when it looked like the enemy was going to overtake me. This is who I was rejoicing in when I looked like I was going to lose my life. This is God, my Savior. He makes that statement with no promise that he would be saved. With no promise that his life would be spared. And yet he makes that bold statement, I will rejoice in God, my Savior. See, our future is not assured to us. We don't know what tomorrow holds. Here's what we know. We serve a God who is my Savior. Who holds me in the palm of his hands. Who says not even a hair on my hair, my head will fall unless he knows about it who has counted and numbered the days of my life. I worship the God, my Savior. This morning, as we celebrate the coming of our Savior, let me encourage you. This is the God who came to be your Savior, who came to take your pain and in the midst of that pain, offer you joy and assurance that he is with you. Who came to say, I will be with you every step of the way. I will watch over you. I will take care of you. I have a plan for your life. You are mine. You belong to me. I will rejoice in God, my Savior. This morning as we come to the communion table, I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward. I want to invite you to meditate on the words this morning. Where's your perspective? Are you focused on things? Or have you found to be able to delight and worship in the God who gives you everything? Is your joy and your happiness based on what you have or don't have were you able to look beyond all the things that will fade away and say, after all of that is gone, still, I belong to him. After all of that is taken away, I am still his child. He's still my father. Are you able to worship when things are going well? Are you able to worship when life gets difficult? Are you able to worship when you hear a good news, and are you able to worship when you hear something that rocks your world? Joy is a perspective, but joy is also a person. 
and joy is a gift from God above. This morning, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you have no idea what it means to have joy, maybe you're visiting, maybe you've been here week in and week in, Jesus is worth our lives, our worship, everything that we have. So let's worship.